Good evening. Good evening. I'm about to get started. I see Mimi says she's already ready. Hey, Mimi, thank you for being ready. Thank you for waiting for me. Hey, Mimi. Um, I um ended up having a couple of meetings. I was going to go live at 9.15, but I had to um, change it and go live a little bit later. I had a meeting at 8.30 and I also had one at 9.15. So, um, we're going to get ready to get started. Well, I'm just going to um, give a couple moments. Oh, you know what? Actually, let me um, give me one moment. Let me see something real quick. I want to um, let's see. I want to make sure I do the same thing I did last night. And that was shout out people who have passed their test. Hold on once. Give me one moment. Let's see. Let me stop sharing for a moment. Give me one moment, everybody. So I've had quite a few people that have reached out to me that passed their tests. So what I want you all to do as you're passing your test, I want you to make sure you are letting me know. So that way I can shout you out. So hold on one second. Let me bring that page into this presentation. I did go live last night. That live was for... Um, everybody that is um, on the clinical side. Okay, let me copy this and let me bring this one into this one. Let's see. Add a new page there. Okay, there we go. And then let's see. <clears throat> Give me one moment, guys. Let me get this page here. Uh Let's see. Is it not going to copy over here? If it doesn't do it, I, I just won't do it. But it worked last night without a problem. But let's see here. Just bear with me for one moment, guys. That's on everybody that's on here. Um, let's see. How do I? Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just go to this page. I'm just going to show you all this page. Let's do it that way. So let's just share this screen. I'll do it that way. So that way I won't hold it up too much longer. Let's do that. Let's share this page here. Okay, share screen. CCMA. Okay, so hopefully you all can see this. So this is what I was trying to show you. I was trying to get it into the new presentation, but I wanted to shout out people who passed this. These are people who have passed the CMAA. So their names are blocked out because I didn't get their permission to post their names. So if you want me to shout you out once you pass your test, let me know. These are people who came back to me and let me know that this review helped them. It made me feel so good to know that these videos are helping. So once you all take your test, comment down below. Let me know what your score is and that it's okay for me to actually post your name without blocking it out okay all righty so let's get this review started let's go ahead and get this review started i don't want to waste any more time it's already late all right cmaa all right perfect let's get it started all right first question well first of all let me just say this so this test tonight is for the administrative side the lab that we did last night was for the clinical side but um, some of the same content will be on both tests, right? So if you are taking the CMA or the RMA exam, don't worry. It's the same, the, the questions won't be the same, but a lot of the same content will be there. So if you are watching this video and you are actually about to take the RMA or CMA, um, um, or, um, you know, an, um, um, or even a CCMA, it's fine. It's, I still recommend you to watch these, but I do recommend you to seek study guides that are specific for those tests. So this will help a little, but I do recommend you to seek those study guides as well. All right, let's get it started. A new patient arrives at your desk while you're on the phone with the patient. What action should you take? Are you going to place the phone, the patient on hold while checking in the new patient? Are you going to make eye contact and nod your head to acknowledge the patient's arrival? Indicate non-verbally for the new patient to take a seat in the waiting area or are you going to give the new patient a registration form and point to the sections that need completing? So let me. Oh, Deloria, I see Deloria is back. The Deloria was with me last night. Okay, um, we had about um, 
think at, at the most last night, I think we had about 13 people participating last night. It was pretty good, pretty good, pretty good study session. Okay, Mimi says A. Anybody else want to chime in and let me know what they think? So this um this this is a situation where you're on the phone and then you have a new patient walks in to get registered. What do you want to do? There is a delay, so I'm going to give you all a moment to get your answer in. Let's see if anybody else. Okay. Oh, Brittany's back too. Okay. I see Brittany's back tonight. Shalandria. Okay. Everybody's saying A. All right. Let's see. Okay. So the answer is actually going to be B. Let's talk about this for a second. So the reason why the answer is not going to be A, because when you're on the phone with the patient, you don't want to put that patient on hold to handle the patient in front of you. Okay. You want to finish with the patient you're already working with. All right. Now, if you were checking the patient in that is in the office in front of you, let's say the new patient had arrived before you got on that phone call. In that case, you could pick up the phone and place the call on hold. Right. But you never want to in you you want to finish with your patient first before you go on to a new patient okay so you want to just make eye contact with that with that person in front of you acknowledge them and then um, finish with your call you're not going to indicate non-verbally for the new patient to take a seat in the waiting area you're not going to give them a form and point to the sections that need complete and that's going to um require you to kind of um ignore your patient on the phone for a second so you want to just make eye contact and nod your head and let me just say this too. If this is your first time getting on a study session with me, I always say when you have these scenario questions, a lot of times you want to think about um, the most professional thing you can do, right? So you these tests, they tend to have a lot of these scenario questions. So you really want to think about, okay, make eye contact and nod your head to acknowledge the patient's arrival. Acknowledging that patient's arrival, that's the most professional thing you can do, Okay. So I hope that made sense to you all. Let's go to the next question. So a patient cannot receive an influenza vaccine due to his egg allergy. The assistant should recognize this as a what? As an adverse effect? Is it a precaution? Is it a contraindication? Or is it an interaction? So a patient cannot receive the flu vaccine because he has an egg allergy. The assistant should recognize this as what? And at first, an adverse effect, a precaution, contraindication, or an interaction. Okay, let's see if anybody answers this in the chat. Okay, somebody says B. Mimi says B. Anybody else want to take a guess at this? Okay, somebody said A. A, I see a couple of A's there. And we're going to talk about these. So one thing, too, I want you all to make sure when you are doing your study, guys, when you're going through studies, study sessions and things like that, I want you all to make sure that you are um, also paying attention to the meanings of the answers that is incorrect, okay, that are incorrect. Why? Because if the if these terms are on the practice test, guess what? That means that's probably something you're going to see on the actual test. So you want to make sure you know what those things mean as well. All right, so we got an A, a couple of, a few A's, a B, and a D. Let's see. Okay, so this is going to be a contraindication, okay? A contraindication, that means that taking this medication is inadvisable, okay? So because um, a patient is um, a patient has this egg allergy, he can't take influenza because there's eggs in the, in the vaccine. That's a contraindication. Um, another example of a contraindication would be a patient not being able to take um, a certain medication because of its ingredients. They may be allergic to something that's in, in the ingredients, okay? Um, adverse effect, that's like um, a side effect, right? That's a, a, a negative effect that happens from taking a medication. Um, precaution, a precaution, an example of a precaution is a pregnant patient not taking a certain medication without talking to her 
provider first. Okay. So, um, and then an interaction, an example of an interaction is two medications interacting with each other. Like one medication could cause another medication to, um, to uh, it'll lessen the effect of another, of another medication. Like certain medications interact, certain foods may interact with certain medications. Okay. So make sure you're, you know, making a note of what these things mean. Okay. So just in case you happen to see any of these on the test. All right. What should be the assistance priority when pulling daily charts? And this is a, one of those questions where you really want to pay attention to keywords priority. So when you see questions like first or initially pay attention to those words, are you going to place the charts in the appropriate exam rooms? review the appointment schedule, review the charts for accuracy, or arrange the charts sequentially. Your priority action when you're pulling daily charts, you're pulling your charts for the day. What's your priority action? Deloria, I'm curious, what test, um, which tests are you taking? I'm just curious. I know you were on a clinical um, study session last night. I'm just wondering which tests are you about to take? I can't, I think you told me last night. I can't remember. Okay. Somebody says C. Patrine, thank you for joining. Hey, Maria. I see Maria's back. Somebody says C. Okay, let's see what the answer is. So this is going to be review the appointment schedule. So that's priority when it comes to pulling daily charts. So place the charts in the exam room. Maybe at some point we will, but that's not priority. Review the charts for accuracy. We will as we are, you know, seeing the patient and entering whatever we need to, arranging the charts sequentially. But we need to review the appointment schedule to even know which charts to pull. So this answer is going to be to review the appointment schedule. That is the priority. And um, daily charts are normally pulled the evening before. Um, Kiera. Hey, Kiera. Kiera's back too. She said, can this help for the NHA certification for medical assistant? I will say yes, Kiera. But I will say definitely still. So the practice test that we did last night, that was specific for the clinical medical assistant. This test tonight is specific for the for the administrative medical system, but the information that's on here definitely because if you remember like this question here, if you remember we had something like this on that practice test last night. So some of the same information will be on here. It's just that this practice test is going to have more administration and maybe a few um, clinical questions. And when I say clinical questions, this is not going to be any clinical questions like the ones we had last night about, you know, we had one question about the intramuscular injection, nothing like that. But there's, there may be some, you know, body system questions or terminology. Oh, Dolores says CCMA. She's almost done. Okay. That's okay. Okay. I remember a few of you told me last and I couldn't remember who was who. All right. Let's get back to the question. All right. Which of the following form authorizes a third party payer to pay a provider directly? Is it the assignment of benefits, the notice of privacy practices, Accept assignment or advance beneficiary notice. It authorizes the third party payer to pay a provider directly. <laughs> Let's see if anybody takes a guess at this. Okay, I don't see any answers coming up in the chat. Let's just go ahead and go to the next one. And if anybody is watching the replay, um, just take those few moments, those pauses to kind of think about your answer. All right, so assignment of benefits. If you were thinking assignments of benefits, assignment of benefits, you are correct. That is the form that a patient signs that authorizes the third-party payer. And when we say third-party payer, we're talking about the insurance company. It authorizes them to pay the provider directly. Another way this may be worded is that the assignment of benefits um, authorizes the provider to bill the insurance. So that may be one way you may see it. Notice of privacy practices. That's the notice that we give to the patient to let them know 
that their information is private. It lets them know how we use their information for insurance purposes. Um, accept assignment is the provider um, accepting um, um, the um, assignment from an insurance company. And then advanced beneficiary notice, that's Medicare's, that's a form that Medicare patients have to sign if the provider feels like Medicare, well, not necessarily the provider himself, but um, there's um, an issue with Medicare. Maybe it's not on a fee schedule. Um, maybe we got some type of notification that Medicare may not cover this procedure. So it could be the provider thinking that, or maybe something that we've gotten from the insurance company from Medicare to let us know, okay, this may not be covered. That's the form that they have. So when you see ABN, think Medicare. All right, which of the following is an el eligibility requirement for Medicaid? Over 65, low income, self-employed, or you have to be a veteran. Which of the following makes you eligible for Medicaid? Many people get Medicaid and Medicare mixed up. This is Medicaid. Okay, Maria says B. All right, A, I see an A and a B, Mimi Veronica. Hey, Veronica. All right, let's see. All right, low income, low income. So um, if you said A, you got that one mixed up with Medicare. A lot of people get those two mixed up. Oh, okay, Mimi says she meant B. Okay, got you, Mimi. Okay, so 65 is Medicare. Self-employed, if you're self-employed, you can, you know, um, get um, private insurance. And then veteran, of course, that will be TRICARE or CHAMPA. When writing an email, which of the following is the purpose of using the BCC option? Is the purpose to require the recipient to send a confirmation of receipt? Does it record a copy of the message on the sender's hard drive? Indicates the message has a high priority? Or does it protect the privacy of each recipient's email address? The BCC option. Good night, Veronica. Oh, that's so I got a Veronica Fish and Veronica Dennis. Veronica Dennis was on with us last night. Listen, I'm not going to be on that late tonight. I'm going to go through this quickly. Last night we were on over an hour and a half. I think about an hour and a half. We are not going to be on that, that long tonight. <laughs> I'm going to be right behind you, Veronica. All right, what do you guys think this one is for the BCC option? All right, let's see. If you were thinking D, you are correct. The BCC stands for blind carbon copy. So that protects the privacy of each recipient's email. Let me just use you all in the chat an example. If I'm emailing Brittany, Deloria, Veronica, and Mimi at the same time, if I put you all's name in the BCC field, nobody can see the other person's email. You all don't even realize I'm emailing um, multiple people at one time. But if we use the, um, the CC option, the CC option, um, carbon copy, that's the option where we don't mind if anybody else sees it. You know, you'll sometimes you may CC like if you're, let's say you're um, messaging your instructor, you may CC your dean, right? Um, because you just want him to be included on the message. Um, all right. A patient pays $30 every time he sees a specialist. This is which of the following types of payments? He pays $30 every time he sees a specialist. What type of payment is that? Is it co-insurance, co-payment, deductible, or premium? Okay, Veronica said B. Maria says B. All right, let's see. Yep, it's a co-payment. So that's the fixed amount that you pay every time you see the doctor. So specialist is $30 and it varies depending on the insurance. So um, he may pay maybe $15 or $20 for his primary care. It's a set fee that you pay every time, whereas co-insurance is a, is a um, percentage of the visit, right? It's, it's a percentage 
um, that you have to pay after the deductible has been met. Now, what is a deductible? That's, that's the out-of-pocket expense that a patient has to pay before the insurance will begin to pay out benefits. So think about car insurance. You know, if you, you guys have car insurance, if you get in an accident and you send in a claim, they won't pay anything until you pay that deductible. Could be 500, could be 1,000 or more, but they won't pay anything. It's the same with um, health insurance. Um, a premium is the fee to, to have the insurance. So like a membership fee, that's what you pay every month or every quarter, every six months or at whatever your schedule is. That's what, that's what the patient pays to keep their insurance active. All right. Altering notes in a patient's medical record to justify medical necessity for payment is considered which of the following? Negligence, fraud, auditing, or unbundling? Negligence, fraud, auditing, or unbundling? All right, B. Maria says B. Anybody else? Okay, Shalandra says B. All right, let's see. Yep, so that's going to be fraud. Altering notes to, to, to justify payment, to justify medical necessity. Anytime you alter notes or falsify information, that's fraud. Negligence is failure to provide reasonable care. Auditing, of course, is when, you know, um, you have to go through and check for compliance and different things like that. You're um, Unbundling um, is separating um, procedures to maximize reimbursement. So instead of, let's say, the doctor does two procedures together, unbundling um, would be to list those procedures separately to um, maximize reimbursement. All right. Which of the following should be included on a claim form? OPIM, OIG, NPI, or COD on a claim form? And I'm sorry, there's a delay. So sometimes, ladies, I see you putting your answers in, but sometimes I, I, by the time I see it, it's just a few minutes later because of the delay. So sorry about that. Okay. Okay, so if you say MPI number, you are correct. That's the National Provider Identifier. That's the 10-digit number that is assigned to the providers, that is um, a requirement for the claim form. OPIM is other potentially infectious material. OIG is the Office of Inspector General. And then COD is uh, cash on delivery, or there's another, um, there's another term for it too, cash on delivery, or there's something else, but it has something to do with the payment that you make uh, upon delivery, cash on delivery, and then there's another one. So it's going to be the NPI number, that 10-digit identifier. All right. So which of the following prevents overlapping payments by an insurance company? Now, um, let me, uh, who was that to ask that question? Oh, yeah, Kiera. So, Kiera, if you're still watching, you might notice that you'll see that this is all administrative stuff, right? There's a few terminology questions here and there, but for the most part, it's all administrative. So, and if you notice that CCMA exam practice we went through, we only had like a few administrative questions. Okay, which of the following prevents overlapping payments by an insurance company? Is it the assignment of benefits, remittance advice, explanation of benefits, or coordination of benefits? Okay, I see C, B, and C's. I see. So that's going to be D. Why is that D? Because coordination of benefits is that's when we are determining um, which um, insurance is primary or secondary. If a patient has two insurances, we have to make sure we're billing the primary insurance 
and not we we're not going to we're not going to build both at the same time because we want to make sure the payments don't overlap if they overlap meaning both payments both insurances pay the doctor at the same time then the doctor is overpaid so that's what the coordination of benefits pre prevents um explanation benefits we talked about that that well i don't know did we talk about that yes i don't know but anyway that's the statement that the patient gets that breaks down how the how the claim was paid so it shows any claim adjustments it shows what was denied what was covered remittance advice is an explanation of benefits that goes to the provider so the explanation of benefits goes to the patient and shows how the payment was made remittance advice goes to the provider and it's a it's a it is a type of explanation of benefits but it goes to the provider instead of going to the patient it shows how payments were made and then assignment of benefits we talked about that that authorizes the physician to bill the insurance and for and it also authorizes the insurance to pay the physician or provider all right um, which of the following types of insurance plans was developed to provide affordable, comprehensive, prepaid health care to policy hold holders? Is it the health savings account, the point of service plan, PPO, pre preferred provider organization, or is it the HMO, the health maintenance organization? Affordable, comprehensive, prepaid health care to policy holders. SEC, SED. See another D. All right, let's see. All right, so if you chose D, you were correct. So um, health savings account, that's account um, that a patient can um, get money deposited into health care um, expenses. So it's a savings type of safe health savings account that's tax free um, and that the patient can get money deposited into. A lot of times they get a direct deposit from their jobs um, and it's strictly for medical expenses. Point of service plan that kind of combines the HMO and PPO. They have some of the benefits of a PPO and some of the benefits of an HMO. PPO is the most flexible plan. It's more expensive, but the patient has a choice of whether they want to go outside of network. They don't have to pick a primary care physician. Whereas an HMO, that is the more affordable plan. However, a patient is limited. So the patient has to pick a primary care and they only can see the doctors in network, meaning the doctors that are in contract with, with that plan. Um, and they have what are called capitation payments. Those are prepaid payments to the provider and it's based on the amount of um, patients that they have enrolled in a plan. plan. For an example, uh, uh, HMO insurance, I'll just say, let me just throw one out there, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Don't quote me. I'm just using it as an example. Let's say they have an HMO plan and that plan pays capitation payments to a practice. If that practice has, let's just say, 300 um, enrollees and 300 patients in that plan, Blue Cross Blue Shield will pay um, that provider's office per enrollee. They'll pay, pay them um, prepaid payments. Okay. All right. If a hazard is not specifically addressed by OSHA, which of the following applies? The employer must use the guidelines from the most applicable existing standard. The employee should purchase personal protective equipment. The employees are covered by the general duty clause or the employer must submit a new standard for OSHA to review. A hazard is not specifically addressed by OSHA. Which applies? Which of the following applies? Okay, Mimi says A, C, Maria says C, D. Okay, I see some mixed answers here. All right, let's see. All right, so if you said C, the answer is correct. So the general duty clause in, within OSHA, the general duty clause says that employers, employers must provide a work environment that is free of hazard period so 
anything that's not specifically addressed by OSHA, if there is no guideline that specifically addresses um, a hazard, it doesn't matter because guess what? The general duty clause says that that facility should be free from hazard, period, okay? So we're not going to use the most applicable existing standard, like find a guideline that's close to the hazard that happened. We're not doing that. Employees should purchase personal protective equipment. No, the employer should have that available for the employees. And then the employer must submit a new standard for OSHA to review. No. All right. Which of the following documents identifies what procedures are allowed if a patient becomes unable to communicate medical decisions? Is it a subpoena, an advanced directive, release of information, or informed consent? The patient signs this document that says, this is what I want if I ever become unable to communicate my medical decisions. Okay, so I see a couple of Bs popped up. I see a D. All right, let's see. Okay, so it's going to be an advanced directive. A subpoena is a court order to um, to appear in court. A subpoena ducis tecum is a court order for um, the medical record or documents. Um, release of information. That is the form that patients sign to authorize release of their health information, and either to themselves, even if they need their own records, they have to sign a release of information or if they want to if they're given permission to release to other providers, they have to sign that form. And then informed consent, that's the consent form for um, procedures. That consent, when a patient signs that consent form, they're saying that they understand the risk and benefits of that procedure. They understand that it may not work. Um, they understand that there's other alternatives out there when they sign that form. All right. For billing purposes, which of the following forms should be attached to a patient's chart for the provider to complete? Is it going to be an encounter form, a patient ledger, a daily log, or a patient statement? Is It needs to be attached for the provider to complete for billing purposes. Okay, see a few A's. Yes, that's correct. Encounter form. So what is the encounter form? The encounter form also called a super bill. Make sure you know that because you will see a question about that. Another name for encounter form is a super bill. Um, that is a, the, the form that the doctor fills out. It has a list of pre-printed um, diagnosis codes and CPT codes that are specific to that practice. This is what the doctor or provider fills out. Um, they they will check off the codes that they use for their patient, so the diagnosis codes, the CPT codes, and that's what we use to fill out the claim form. We take that information and we put it on the claim form. Um, patient ledger, that is a, um, a list of patient charges, payments and charges that go that's um, in their chart. Daily log is like um, referring to the, the daily log of um, financial transactions for the day. Um, also refers to the day sheet that we keep, that where we keep track of the payments received for the day. And in patient statement, that would be um, like the patient billing statement. That's not something that we would need to attach for the provider to complete. So you all were correct in choosing encounter form. All right. What is the main? Oh, I just mentioned this. What is the main purpose of a day sheet? Um, to provide daily practice analysis, to track daily cash transactions to ensure accurate accounting or to improve patient flow. A day sheet. Purpose of a day sheet.
All right, let's see. All right, so this I know probably threw you off a little bit because I just said transactions in the last um, question, but I didn't just mean cash transactions. I meant all of the transactions for today. So whether it's credit card payments or um, cash or check payments. So the overall goal, the main goal is to ensure accurate accounting. So it's to make sure that you know, we're keeping track of payments going in and payments going out. That's the main purpose of it, not just cash transactions, because like I said, it's, it's any type of transaction, credit card, check. Um, so um, that's why it wasn't B, but I can see how um, <laughs> she says super bill sounds scary. <laughs> Deloria says super, that's the name of it. <laughs> Deloria super bill. She said it sounds scary. All right, let's go ahead. Oh, and um, by the way, the, it doesn't have anything to do with um, patient flow, that day she and imp will improve in patient flow. All right, which of the following describes an urgent referral? It takes 24 hours to receive approval and it's for a non-life-threatening condition. It's approved over the phone within minutes and is used during emergency. It takes three to 10 working days for review and approval. It is approved immediately and submitted electronically. An urgent referral. All right, let's see. All right, so if you chose A, that's correct. It takes 24 hours for approval and it's for a non life threatening emergency. So, um, non life, life, I'm sorry, I got tongue tied for a second. You can tell I'm tired. Um, for a non life threatening condition. So, um, urgent is different from emergency or stat. Emergency or stat, that is the a referral that is approved right away. If it says emergency or stat, that means if it says stat, that means the doctor needs it right away. If a person goes for a blood work, that's it says stat. That means the doctor wants the results right away. Okay. If, if it's a stat referral, that means they need the patient seen right away. Okay. So see, we can automatically rule that out because that says three to 10 days. But urgent, when you see that 24 hours for non-life threatening, that means it's important, but it's not necessarily life threatening. Okay. So the patient doesn't necessarily need it, right? They it, it's urgent, meaning that that they need to be seen soon, but they won't die today, you know. All right, it's kind of like an urgent care facility versus an emergency room, right? All righty, an emancipated minor is scheduled for an amniocentesis. Which of the following consents need to be signed? Implied consent, informed consent, parental consent, or verbal consent. Oh, yeah, Shalandra said that was a little confusing. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I, I understand. Uh, my students and I were talking about that same thing. That's because the urgent versus emergency. But just remember, emergency is right away, it's stat versus urgent means, you know, it can, it, the, it, it can go like a day. Let me see. An example of an uh, urgent may be, let's say a patient is having blood in their stool, right? That's important. That's urgent. You know, you want to look into that, make sure the patient isn't having any internal bleeding, but it's not something, it's not like a patient who is having chest pain and shortness of breath where it's a, a dire emergency. So I hope that made a little bit more sense. Okay, let's see. So if you chose informed consent for this one, that's correct. So amniocentesis, that's a procedure. So that's um, removing um, amniotic fluid, right? So um, first of all, centesis is um, one thing I will tell you all, you want to be able to recognize certain suffixes. So there's not a whole lot of medical term on the test, but you don't know because every test is different. So you may get a test that has a lot of terminology on it. So you want to make sure you're able to recognize these, you know, these um, suffixes and some prefixes, because that's going to be the key to your answer for some of these questions. OK, um, but anyway, that's a procedure. Remove fluid from the amniotic sac um, and you need the informed consent sign. It's for procedures to, you know, sign that you understand the risk and benefits of that procedure. 
Implied consent, that is not a signed consent. Implied, think about what something means to be implied. It means to be suggested. It's not verbalized. It's not written. An example of implied consent would be like your patient giving you their arm to draw their blood. Um, uh, another example of implied consent is rescuing a, um, an unresponsive patient. You can assume because they're unconscious, you can assume that you have their consent to save their life, right? If a person gives you their arm to draw their blood based on their actions, the consent is implied, okay? So that's not a, a verbalized or signed consent. Doesn't need to be a parental consent either because it's emancipated minor and an emancipated minor is treated as an adult. It's a legal adult. Um, and then verbal has to be written. So verbal consent is not correct. Okay. Which of the following describes the difference between Medicaid and Medicare? Okay. It's, I'm going to let you all read these. It's, I know this is a lot, but pay close attention. One of those questions that's tricky. Virginia, is that C to this question or was that the last question? I wasn't sure. But read this carefully. The difference between Medicaid and Medicare. Okay, I see some answers popping up here. Yes, C is correct. Those of you that chose C, that's correct. Medicare is funded by the federal government, but Medicaid is funded by both state and federal. So Medicare um, is pretty much, you know, across the board. It's a federal program. It's a federal insurance that's, you know, the same across the board, whereas Medicaid is funded by both state and federal governments, and they Medicaid varies from state to state, right? So Medicare, um, DC Medicaid, where I am is different from like Virginia Medicaid or Maryland Medicaid, but Medicare is the same across the board. This one was, the first one could be tricky if you read it too fast. It says Medicare serves medically needy and Medicaid serves 65 and older. It's actually the other way around. Med this one, another one is flipped around. Medicare doesn't pay monthly premiums. They actually do. Medicaid does not. So you all did well with answering this correct. And then Medicare is a health cost assistance program. And then Medicaid is insurance. It's actually the other way around. Medicaid is actually a health cost assistance program. And then Medicare is insurance. All right. Which, which action should you take when collecting money from a patient? Are you going to write off the amount owed? Are you going to reduce the payment for services rendered, build the patient's co-signer, or are you going to clarify the patient's financial responsibility policy? All right. So if you said D, that's the correct answer. You want to clarify the patient's financial responsibility policy. So we're definitely not writing off the amount owed. Um, when you write off the amount, that means that you are pretty much excusing the patient from that uh, from that amount that they owe. So it's not like, um, you know, they paid you and you're, you know, um, putting in the patient. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, you're not um, adjusting the patient's account to say that they've made a payment. No, when you write off an amount, that means that you're pretty much excusing the patient from that payment. Um, reduce the payment. We're not doing that. Build a patient's co-signer. If anything, it will be the guarantor because that's who is responsible for the payment, but not a co-signer. When retrieving voicemails, which of the following messages should be addressed first? Patient calling to cancel and reschedule. 
a patient calling to report high blood glucose levels and rapid breathing, patient calling about a referral, well, I'm sorry, provider calling about a patient referral, or an insurance company representative calling about an upcoming enrollment deadline for the staff. So you check your voicemails and you got all these messages. Which one are you going to address first? Oops, I don't know why. I don't know if you all can see this on my screen. Let me get rid of it. Why do I get rid of this off my screen? Okay. All right, let's see. B is the correct answer. So canceling the rescheduling an appointment, we'll, we can, we'll call them back. A provider calling about a patient referral, we'll call them back. An insurance company, we'll call them back. But those are not emergency calls that we need to take right away, right? But a patient calling about the high blood glucose levels, her, her sugar is high and she's having rapid breathing, absolutely, we want to call her back as soon as possible. Uh, which of the following is most commonly used by medical facilities? First class mail, media mail, parcel post, or second class mail? Okay. Yep, first class mail. That's the most commonly used. The others, not so much, but definitely first class. Okay. Um, and I'm if you all that were on last night, you probably noticed I'm going a little bit faster tonight than what I was last night. I'm very tired tonight. When I got off, just got off class at 8:30 with my students. Today was our very last day into the next semester. And um, begins next month. And then I had a meeting at 9 15 and I had one. I'm sorry, yeah, 8 30. I had a meeting at 8 30 and 9 15. So that's why I'm going faster tonight than last night. Um, all right, which of the following lists, following lists frequently used diagnosis and procedural codes in one place for easy access? Is it a patient ledger, explanation of benefits, CMS 1500 claim form, or an encounter form? Frequently used diagnosis and procedural codes in one place. All right, let's see. Oopsie, I almost exited out the program. Okay. It's going to be D. We just talked about that a few minutes ago when we talked about encounter form and super bill. So why is it not C? Because the claim form does not already have diagnosis and codes on it. The claim form is blank. We have to add the codes to the claim form. But the encounter form already has pre-printed diagnosis and procedure codes. And the doctor fills that out and they give it to you. And we use that information to fill out the claim form. We've already talked about what the explanation of benefits and the patient ledger was, so we can easily rule those out. But I could see why some people may say this, but no. This is exactly why I told you all last night. The next um, next week, I'm going to do a video on the differences between the claim form and encounter form. So I'm going to do this video because I noticed uh, quite a few people get these mixed up. So I'll be doing that next week. All right. A physician abruptly terminates a physician-patient contract. This can lead to which of the following? Non-payment of the patient's medical bills, emancipation of the patient, abandonment of the patient, or revocation of the physician's medical license.
Okay, so if you chose C, abandonment of the patient, that is correct. Let's talk about that for a second. So if a physician abruptly terminates a physician-patient contract, he or she can be sued for abandonment. So what is a physician-patient contract? Remember um, how we talked about implied consent and informed consent a few questions ago? Well, there is a such thing as implied contract as well, where you know, um, you don't necessarily sign or verbalize that you're in contract, but based on your actions, you enter contract. A physician patient contract is one of those things. It's an implied contract, meaning once that patient shows up for the appointment and that physician begins to see that patient, they are legally in a physician patient contract. And the physician can be sued for abruptly um, terminating that contract. Many people don't know that, but the provider is obligated to give you if there's a five step process that they have to go through to let you go. Unless something happens and the patient is just outright, you know, a danger to the practice, they have to go through a process of letting that patient go or they can be sued for abandonment. OK, so that's very important to know because you will see questions about that on the test. All right. Scheduling all well child visits on Tuesday and Thursday mornings is an example of which type of scheduling? Open hours, modified wave, double booking or clustering. And we did see some scheduling questions on that test last night. Um, Veronica, you were on here. We had some scheduling questions um, on the clinical exam as well. Is it open hours, modified wave, double booking, or clustering? All the well child visits are scheduled on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. Which type of scheduling is that? If you said clustering, that is correct. So cluster, clustering or grouping. Think of a group, a cluster or something as a group of something. So that means that all... That means the same type of appointments, right? They have predetermined days and times. So that means all those types of visits are going to be seen in the same blocks of time. Open hours, that is, you know, like walk-ins or urgent care, right? That's when, or even emergency room, that's when that there's no appointment times given. It's open and patients are seen as they arrive or according to their, um, um, their um, symptoms, Modified wave is a form of wave scheduling where patients um, are scheduled, maybe a couple patients may be scheduled at the top of the hour, and then another patient will be scheduled at the other half, maybe at nine. Let's say two patients are scheduled at nine o'clock, and then they may have another patient scheduled at 9.30. That's an example of modified wave. Um, double booking or is, you know, it, that happens when several patients, two or more patients are scheduled in the exact same time slot. That's double booking. Oh, Mimi said, I saw that on one of your other lessons. Okay, Mimi. So you watched the other videos. That's good. Last question. You are scheduling a patient for an electroencephalogram. Which of the following statements by you is appropriate? This procedure is used to test how your heart functions. This procedure records your brain's electrical activity. This procedure records your lung function, or this procedure is used to assess your electrolyte levels. Electroencephalogram. Okay, I see these answers are coming in quick. All right. If you said B, you're correct. Now, I told you I recognize those. Um, recognize those. When you see the terminology, encephalo refers to the brain, right? So you can automatically, even if you didn't know what electro or gram meant, you see that encephalo in there, you see that that is the brain, right? So that records the brain's electrical activity. Now it was cardio. We know it was um, heart, right? It will be, it will be um, dealing with the heart. Lung, we will see what? Pneumo or pulmono. And then electrolyte levels, that would be blood work, okay? You all did very well tonight. You all are doing very well. So I hope that this was very helpful to you all. 
Um, this is going to be the end. I managed to get it done within an hour. Like I said, last night we were on for an hour and a half. I'm very tired tonight. <laughs> Thank you all for hanging in there with me. If you haven't already, exit out the chat and like this video for me. So that way it can, you know, kind of get out there so more people can see it. I'm loving helping people prepare for this exam. It makes me so happy when people come back and tell me they passed. Um, so I want you all to, you know, if you had to watch this video again, that's fine. Do so. I hope it, it was helpful. Um, I'm going to do a part two CCMA soon. It won't be next week. It'll be the week after next because I'm actually um, going out of town on Monday. So look out for that within a couple weeks. If you all have any video suggestions, please make sure you leave that down in the comment section. Let me know video suggestions, ideas, things you want me to talk about on this channel. I will. Um, so look out for my upcoming videos. Thank you all. I wish you all success with these tests and let me know how you all are doing. Veronica says, get some well-deserved rest. I am. Thank you. Patrine said, you're a blessing. Thank you so much, Patrine. I really enjoy helping you all with this information. And I'm so grateful for all, all of you all that stuck on here um, tonight. Good night, Mimi. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. If there's any gentlemen, I think there's all ladies. Oh, Christasia, I see you're back. I didn't notice you at first. Christasia was here last night. Deloria was here. Veronica Dennis was here last night. Glad to see you all back again tonight. All righty, everyone. Have a good night.